It was a routine flight review. Two pilots in a well-known amateur-built aircraft, clear skies, no reported mechanical issues, and then suddenly, a violent near-vertical crash into a cornfield. No distress call, no witnesses, just a puzzling flight path and two lives lost. The NTSB has now released its preliminary findings on what happened to November 847 Charlie Sierra, and while it's way too early for conclusions, the early details are, honestly, they raise a lot of questions. Let's begin with who was on board. The aircraft was being flown by Scott Wentz, a 60-year-old pilot from Grace Lake, Illinois. According to publicly available sources, he was IFR rated and flying under basic med privileges, which is a special certification option available for non-commercial pilots who meet certain medical and operational conditions. He was also reportedly the builder of the aircraft. This was a Vans RV-10, a four-seat single-engine plane that's become incredibly popular in the experimental and home-built aviation world. These planes, when properly built and maintained, have proven to be solid and versatile aircraft. Joining him was Kenneth Serzinski, 74, from Beach Park, Illinois. He was likely serving as the flight instructor, as the purpose of the flight was a biennial flight review, basically a check-in every 24 months to ensure the pilot stays sharp and legal to fly. It's not a check ride, and there's no pass-fail grade, just an opportunity to brush up skills under supervision. What makes this particularly painful is that both were experienced, both knew what they were doing, and yet something went terribly wrong not long after they took off. The flight began on June 28, 2025, around 9.09 .09 a.m. from Waukegan National Airport, just north of Chicago. The aircraft's ADSB data, essentially GPS-based position tracking, shows it climbed to about 3,300 feet above mean sea level after departure and turned west. That part of the flight? Totally normal. Then, the track shows something interesting. The RV-10 flew a pattern that matches what we often see during maneuver practice, things like steep turns, slow flight, or recovery from simulated emergencies, all of which are standard parts of a flight review. But at around 9.31.53, something changed. The plane entered a descending right-hand spiral, starting from roughly 3,000 feet MSL. That's not necessarily alarming at first glance. It could have been a planned maneuver. But the descent continued in a tightening path, with two full 360-degree turns, each pulling the aircraft closer to the ground. At 9.33.33, the flight path briefly levels out and shifts northwest. That might have been an attempt to regain control, or maybe even a setup for another maneuver. But then just 13 seconds later, it turns again, this time toward the east, and begins descending fast. Now this is the part that really stands out. By the time the last ADSB signal was picked up at 9.34.05, the aircraft was only 315 feet above ground level, descending at about 2,850 feet per minute, and slowing to just 54 knots of calibrated airspeed. To put that in context, that's getting dangerously close to the stall speed, the point where the wings stop producing enough lift to keep the aircraft flying. Depending on aircraft configuration and weight, 54 knots could be flirting with, or even under, the stall threshold. That data, especially the steep descent rate and low airspeed, paints a picture of an aircraft either out of control or struggling to recover from something that happened mid-maneuver. But again, we don't know why. There's no radio call, no witness statements, just the hard data, and a deeply concerning end to what began as a perfectly ordinary morning flight. Now here's where it gets really interesting, and honestly, a bit frustrating from an investigator's point of view, because when the NTSB looked at the wreckage, they didn't find anything obvious. In fact, they found what appears to be a mechanically sound aircraft. The engine, which was partially buried in the impact crater, showed no internal damage. The crankshaft turned normally, compression was present in all cylinders, and oil levels were sufficient. The fuel system, also intact, there was fuel in the lines, 
the selector valve, and the fuel servo. No signs of contamination, blockage, or vapor lock. The pump even discharged fuel when operated manually. And then there's the propeller. One of the blades showed classic signs of rotation, an S-shaped bend, cord-wise scratches and nicks along the leading edge. That usually means the engine was turning when it hit the ground. But the other blade, it was relatively straight. That's weird. It doesn't necessarily prove anything, but it could suggest the engine wasn't producing full power at the moment of impact, or maybe it was just idling. Flight controls were a little more complicated. Due to the severity of the crash, full control continuity couldn't be confirmed, but all major components, elevators, rudder, ailerons, were found at the scene. The brakes that did exist were consistent with impact-related overload, not pre-existing failure. So what does this all point to? Well, the aircraft itself doesn't appear to have failed. That's a big deal. It shifts the focus toward things like pilot decision-making, possible disorientation, or misjudged maneuvers. Not in a critical way, this isn't about blaming anyone, but if the machine was working as intended, then the mystery becomes, why did it end the way it did? To understand this crash better, it helps to look beyond it, especially at patterns involving the same type of aircraft. The Vans RV-10 has a strong reputation in the general aviation world. It's roomy, fast, and has good range. But like all amateur-built aircraft, there's variability in how it's assembled. Some builders are meticulous. Others, maybe less so. And small build differences, like wire routing, control rigging, or modifications, can matter a lot, especially under stress. One case that really stands out happened just six months before this one. In January 2025, at Fullerton Municipal Airport in California, an RV-10 crashed shortly after takeoff because a non-standard door latch modification allowed the door to come open in flight. That might not sound catastrophic, but in that particular aircraft, it led to severe instability, loss of control, and a crash into a warehouse. Two people died, and 19 others were injured on the ground. The investigation later found that the builder had skipped installing a secondary safety latch, something strongly recommended by Vans. Now, let's be clear. There is no indication that November 847, Charlie Sierra, had that same door latch issue. But it shows how even minor deviations from design standards can cascade into fatal outcomes. Other past RV-10 crashes have also involved loss of control during low-altitude maneuvering, often while the pilot was performing training exercises or pattern work. That makes this current case feel familiar and adds weight to the idea that something might have gone wrong during a routine review maneuver. The truly frustrating thing about crashes like this is just how deceptively normal everything seems leading up to them. Good weather, no mechanical faults, two experienced people in the cockpit, and yet, it still ended in tragedy. There's a big lesson here. Clear skies do not mean a safe flight. In fact, most general aviation fatalities happen in visual conditions. Why? Because in those environments, pilots may feel more relaxed, less pressure, fewer distractions. But that's also when complacency and overconfidence can creep in, especially during routine ops like a flight review. One specific technical factor that keeps coming up in this case is stall and spin awareness. When an aircraft slows below its stall speed, lift drops off dramatically. And if it's also turning, or in a descending spiral, that can quickly turn into a spin. And here's the catch. Recovering from a spin takes altitude. If you're already down low, the recovery window just doesn't exist. It's gone. This isn't about pointing fingers. It's about perspective. Scott Wentz and Kenneth Serzinski were both experienced aviators. They were doing what thousands of pilots do every day. Our job now, as a flying community, and as viewers trying to learn from this, is to honor them by taking this case seriously. By looking closely at what went wrong, not to judge, but to prevent someone else from ending up in the same situation. At this stage, the NTSB has not issued a final report. Investigators are still analyzing recovered avionics, like the primary flight display, or PFD, 
and multifunction display, or MFD, which could tell us more about the plane's pitch, airspeed, and control inputs in those final seconds. And that data might change things. It could provide vital context or surface issues that weren't obvious from the wreckage. So we're going to stay tuned, and when the final report drops, we'll be here to walk through it with you. Until then, the lesson is clear. Even familiar flights demand our full attention. Whether you're a student pilot or a 10,000-hour CFI, aviation doesn't hand out second chances when you're that close to the margins. If you found this analysis helpful, or if you want to stay updated on future safety breakdowns, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, and share this with someone who flies. The more we talk about these things, the better we all get at avoiding them. Fly safe.